there is a method of struggle, there is a strategy, there is a way to fight against injustice and oppression without relying on violence. And so that was where I think the light bulb went off and I hit the ground running and, and, and wanted to go in this direction and learn more about it. Hi, my name is Darren Cambridge. I'm a supporter of Nonviolent Action, and today we're going to talk about my work with international human rights. So, back when I was in college, I was in college from 99 to 2003, and uh, if you know, that was like a pretty pivotal moment in uh, American history and world history. That was when 9 11 happened in 2001. And so that was a shock to the system and actually forced me to pay a little bit more attention to what's happening around the world, what the United States is doing around the world, how it affects people, and then the reactions to that, etc. When the president at the time, George W. Bush, was making a case for war, I and many other people had realized that this was a problematic case and that Iraq and the Iraqi people had nothing to do with this attack on the United States. So I became really politically active, very much anti-war, when that war broke out. Because that was a moment where on your television screen you could see just bombs and missiles exploding. And what I saw was people's homes, businesses, families, their livelihoods being destroyed. And these are people who had absolutely nothing to do with the attacks on 9-11. And so I started questioning the whole uh, case for war, looking at the history of war, why people wage it, what are the motives behind it, ulterior motives behind it. The issue was, I was an anti-war person. I wrote a lot in the school paper, participated in, in demonstrations and whatnot, but I didn't really have an alternative, right? So I knew that many people around the world lived under oppressive conditions. They faced injustice and they had every right to fight back against it so that they didn't have to live in, under those conditions. I just knew that I didn't want it to be war and violence and killing, but again, I didn't have any alternative. So I realized that if anyone were to come up to me and say, okay, Darren, you know, it's great that you're against war, but what do you say to people who are living under oppression and want to fight back? I wouldn't have had an answer to them. And I didn't at that point in my life until I took a class called the Geography of Peace. And I took this, I believe it was my senior year, so 2003. And it was the first time this class had ever been offered at the college that I was attending. And it was a course that was designed by a professor who for years had been teaching the geography of war. And the geography of war had been one of the most popular courses in that department, in the geography department. And so he was responding, reacting to 9-11 and the war in Iraq in similar ways that other people were and realized, if I've been teaching geography of war, what's the geography of peace? And maybe that should be taught as well. So I took the class and that was, a transformative experience because it exposed me to perspectives, histories, individuals, moments in time that had a huge impact on history but wasn't war and wasn't killing and wasn't violence. And one particular resource in that class that we used to learn was a documentary series called A Force More Powerful and then there's a companion book that goes along with it. Uh, folks who don't know, The Force More Powerful is it's a documentary series that looks at six different nonviolent movements in the 20th century from India's independence movement, Polish solidarity struggle, U.S. civil rights movement, South Africa's anti-apartheid struggle. All of these movements where people use nonviolent civil resistance to win greater freedom and rights. But the one that I think struck me the most was the stories about the civil rights movement. The reason that it had such an impact on me was because, you know, I grew up in a socially conscious household and I felt like at that point I, I knew a lot about the civil rights movement, right? That's what I thought. But little did I know that there was a whole strategic aspect of nonviolent action that, that, that folks utilize in the civil rights movement that I was completely oblivious to. And so learning about James Lawson, um, who was considered like the mind of the movement for the U.S. civil rights movement, um, and the research that he had done, the learning that he'd done about previous nonviolent movements, particularly those in India, he brought those lessons back to the United States. And then the entire movement, you know, adopted or endorsed this approach and the strategy. So seeing the history and the strategy behind nonviolent struggle, seeing how there were intentional trainings to prepare people to 
weight struggle, albeit through nonviolent means, was just like all of a sudden I now had an answer to that question that I didn't, you know, two months prior, which was there is a method of struggle, there is a strategy, there is a way to fight against injustice and oppression without relying on violence. And so that was where I think the light bulb went off and I hit the ground running and, and, and wanted to go in this direction and learn more about it. I think for a long time, nonviolent struggle was seen as, or treated as, um, not as threatening as it actually was. It was misunderstood. And so we can obviously go back in history and point at a lot of nonviolent movements that were successful. And current research has shown that it has been more successful than violent struggle and war. But I don't think it was until the last maybe 15 years where those who um, stand to lose when faced with that type of struggle really started exploring it for their own means and ends, which is essentially how to defeat it, subvert it, et cetera. So I think the more attention that it gets, it gets more attention not just from those who want to wage it, it also gets more attention from those who want to suppress it. And I think in this information age, I think that's one of the biggest challenges where, uh, and this is a tactic that dictators and oppressive regimes, um, corporations, uh, you know, any entities that are wielding uh, unjust power, they want to claim that what is an indigenous or grassroots movement isn't actually that, that it's being orchestrated by some other uh, group or entity. Uh, so if this is a nonviolent movement happening, um, you know, against a, a, a brutal regime or dictatorship, they'll claim, oh, this, you know, movement is being um, paid for and directed by uh, our enemies in another country, you know, be it in the West or our neighboring country that we have a conflict with. And so they start to see doubt in people's minds of whether or not this is something that is authentic that they want to be part of. And I think they're getting more savvy at that, um, particularly in the age where it's so much easier to get into people's minds um, and start shaping uh, their opinions. It was a little bit more difficult, you know, even 20 years ago, to get a mass message out to people and have it be infectious. Uh, now it's, it's a lot easier. So I think that's a battle that has started to, um, you know, really take shape over the last 15 years, I think that's going to be, continue to be a big challenge. For a long time, nonviolent struggle was seen as, or treated as, um, not as threatening as it actually was. It was misunderstood. And so we can obviously go back in history and point at a lot of nonviolent movements that were successful, and current research has shown that it has been more successful than violent struggle and war. But I don't think it was until the last maybe 15 years where those who um, stand to lose when faced with that type of struggle really started exploring it for their own means and ends, which is essentially how to defeat it, subvert it, et cetera. So I think the more attention that it gets, it gets more attention not just from those who want to wage it, it also gets more attention from those who want to suppress it. And I think in this information age, I think that's one of the biggest challenges where, uh, and this is a tactic that dictators and oppressive regimes, um, corporations, uh, you know, any entities that are wielding uh, unjust power, they want to claim that what is an indigenous or grassroots movement isn't actually that, that it's, being orchestrated by some other uh, group or entity. Uh, so if this is a nonviolent movement happening, um, you know, against a, a, a brutal regime or dictatorship, they'll claim, oh, this, you know, movement is being um, paid for and directed by uh, our enemies in another country, you know, be it in the West or our neighboring country that we have a conflict with. And so they start to see doubt in people's minds of whether or not this is something that is authentic that they want to be part of. And I think they're getting more savvy at that, um, particularly in the age where it's so much easier to get into people's minds um, and start shaping uh, their opinions. It was a little bit more difficult, you know, even 20 years ago, to get a mass message out to people and have it be infectious. Uh, now it's, it's a lot easier. So I think that's a battle that has started to, um, you know, really take shape 
over the last 15 years, and I think that's going to be continue to be a big challenge. Um, I'm trying to think of other challenges. Uh, there are many. Um, I mean, that was definitely a great answer. Yeah. So I think in the era, in the information era, the misinformation is just as important and be able to turn bias and back checking and source checking and kind of understanding what you're reading and not just buying into it is something that's, you know, fluctuated in the more recent era. Yeah. So here's another challenge coming from the other angle. So I think that's a challenge that is born out of, you know, brutal and oppressive regimes that are trying to stop or thwart nonviolent movements. But then there's challenges that come from within movements them, themselves. And I think one of those, and it goes back to the um, capacity that we now have to engage people in struggle, it has, it, it in many cases has become a pretty low lift. And so this is an argument that's been shared, I think, time and time again around, you know, slacktivism or armchair activism and things like that, where you can feel uh, like you're making a significant impact to creating social change by doing lots of little things, whether it's liking something or signing a petition. And I don't want to diminish the value of those things because I think anything that raises a level of consciousness in people that they weren't aware of five minutes before they clicked that thing, I think it's a step in the right direction. So I don't want to diminish that. I just think that the work that movements are getting better and better at doing is you know, helping people graduate from love, one level of engagement to the next. So you can get hundreds of thousands of people to become aware of something. How do you take, it doesn't need to be all of them, but how do you take a fraction of those individuals, a small fraction of those individuals, to take a little bit of a larger step and a larger uh, level of engagement in the struggle? And then those, some will continue to graduate to further and further levels. Uh, and there's psychology behind that as well that you know movements have utilized for years where it's baby steps You know you develop a habit you develop a way of thinking first and that becomes part of folks like rhythm and way of thinking um, And then you ask them to do something bigger um, something a little bit more risky uh, And they're more willing to do that because they've spent four or five weeks or a year at this level they become accustomed to that and they're ready to take the next level. So I think that's um, a challenge and an opportunity at the same time. Yeah, I mean, I support Nonviolence International because they've been on the front lines of uh, nonviolent social change across the world for years, decades, um, 30 years, um, as the timing of this interview. So uh, there's not a lot of organizations out there that fit that description. And an organization that has international um, connections and breadth is also quite rare um, and the ability to actually affect some type of change so there might be organizations that have awareness of movements that are happening around the world in different countries and different cultures um, but the more you spread yourself the harder it is to really go deep with some of those movements um, versus organizations that focus on one particular issue in one particular region or part of the world and then they can go really deep there but their, their ability to impact things outside of that are somewhat limited. I think Nonviolence International um, has remarkably created a good balance between that because it's been a small operation for a long time. And I think a lot of that's just built off relationships. I mean, you have someone like Mubarak Awad who, you know, has literally on the front lines of the Palestinian struggle um, and taking that experience, taking those lessons, taking um, those relationships and turning it into something even bigger that other movements around the world can, can learn from gain inspiration from. And uh, that takes a lot of, uh, that, that takes visionary thinking. Um, I think another reason that I support Nonviolence International or how I kind of developed a relationship with Mubarak and, and, and Michael uh, in particular is a connection we have with American University in Washington, D.C. So we've all have taught there in some capacity or another over the years. and. American University, I went there for my master's degree and taught there for several years. I celebrate that because American University has a lot of great courses and programs um, and groups and initiatives rooted in peace education, nonviolence, and so forth. So Mubarak and Michael have taught courses. There's folks like Barbara Ween, Colin McCarthy, uh, the list goes on and on. And I've always felt like 
American University is part of this rich tradition of you know a handful or dozens of other universities around you know, America and, and around the world that really invest in this as uh, an academic discipline and as uh, a trajectory for students to, to, to follow. So that's been admirable to just watch them as just organizers, first and foremost, and then two uh, managers of an organization. That's a whole other skill set. Uh, staff and finances, strategic planning. Uh, no one should ever underestimate how important that is and critical it is for someone to be successful. And then also it's like teachers and educators. Um, so that's been my connection with Nonviolence International. I, you know, I intend for that to remain for another 30 years. Any time you, any time you spend with them, you feel the deep commitment. I think there's, again, a lot of great organizations, a lot of great movements, but people come and go, right? Because um, the work is exciting. Um, but then a lot of people will just kind of move on to the next thing. And you don't get that vibe at all. I mean, they've shown for 30 years that they feel this. This is like part of who they are. And I don't think you come across that too often. And when you do, you hold on to it. Uh, you don't want to lose those types of people in your lives because I think they tap into a way that the human spirit can, can shine and thrive and be put to good use um, to assist others or gain inspiration from others. And so the, I don't know, those are the kind of people I like to surround myself with. And that has uh, never you know, uh, steered me wrong. And so that's, that's another reason why I think they've been like a key part of, of, of my growth. Yeah, storytelling is what people gravitate towards. It's entertaining, that's not the best word because it's oftentimes associated with just kind of um, mindless entertainment, but it's entertaining in the sense that it draws you into an arc that you want to follow and you want to see to the end. And I think when we talk about like abstract, things that can seem abstract, theories or approaches, be it through peace building or nonviolent action, it's a little bit harder for people to get on that train and continue it to its end. Um, some people totally into that, um, others not so much. So I feel like a great avenue to get people to get on that train and understand those perspectives is through storytelling. I mean, the whole example I gave around A Force More Powerful in the documentary series, I got into it because it wasn't a theoretical exploration of civil resistance. It was the story of an actual movement and the individuals within that movement. And that's what hooked me. And I can watch and read those stories over and over again. I think that's another thing too, where we can learn so much from like movies and I think now this like burgeoning field of podcasting where people will take time out of their day, carve time out of their busy day and their busy schedule to watch something on television, a documentary series or a sitcom or what have you, Game of Thrones, all that kind of stuff. They'll take time out of their day to like, I'm gonna to listen to this hour long podcast. And they're gonna learn a lot from it, depending on what they're watching. But I see that I'm always like, we all, a lot of people talk about just being busy, not having enough time in their day to explore something that they're interested in. But we do find time to read a good book. We'll take an hour before we go to bed or watch something on television or listen to a podcast. So how do we take that same skill set of writing a story, telling a story, documenting a story, to teach about something that can initially seem like it's abstract. <clears throat> so you know, a lived experience with that has been when I worked at the U.S. Institute of Peace, we were designing courses, teaching courses on peace building and negotiation and conflict transformation and nonviolent action. And uh, we would provide a lot of the theoretical concepts that are important for this work. But we also have these connections uh, to a lot of individuals who have lived experience practicing or seeing these concepts in real life. And so we, instead of doing the webinars, um, which can tend to be just you know PowerPoint presentation and you know people just kind of get sharing these like theories, it quickly transformed into let me help someone tell their story and unpack parts of it that is relevant to the learning, but also maybe unpack parts of the story that 
they hadn't even unpacked yet. And that was some of the most like fascinating work, at least for me, and I hope for the learners to, again, explore these skill sets and explore these concepts through someone's story. So I, you know, I always, one of my goals when I would sit down and like host and interview people for this podcast was to start the podcast just by, you know, building rapport with the individual. And I'd always try and ask a question or prompt them with something that was going to reveal something about themselves that you couldn't find searching about them online. Um, I didn't want to just have them repeat things that you could get again in the jacket of the book that they wrote or the CV that's on LinkedIn or something like that. It was what's an angle that's going to get people to be like, oh wow, there's this interesting connection that I have with you on a human level, not so much like what your professional identity is, your accolades and things like that. Um, so that that was, I think, a really good experience and I think a lot of people walked away from those interviews saying like, that was a really good experience for me too. <laughs> you know, it's like we had this hour long conversation, an hour and a half long conversation and I'm thinking about myself and my work and my history in a way that I, I wasn't before. So I, I think it has a benefit not just those who are hearing the story or reading the story, but also those who are unpacking their own story or, or writing it themselves. Uh, so that's always been a, a good experience. I think broadly for teaching, I'm a huge advocate for embracing technology where appropriate. I think you know there's some who are like, just stick it to old school, chalkboard and chalk, desks in a you know a brick and mortar classroom lecture hall whatever i think there's a time and place for that then there are those who are like all in for technology we're moving in that direction um, it gives us a lot of advantages and we can connect with people across great distances we can do it online from wherever we are etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, the way that i approach technology and teaching and learning is use technology in a way that allows you to do things that you are unable to do in a face-to-face, non-digital, no-tech space. Don't try and recreate the face-to-face experience through some form of technology. I think from my experience, as someone who's maybe attempted that or also been on the receiving end of that as a learner, it always fails. It's never as good, right? Like, there's something really powerful about sharing physical space and time with other breathing bodies with a heartbeat. Like, even if it's an lecture hall, some people don't like lectures, but at least you're sitting next to somebody, you, you, you feel their presence, um, you can read people's body language, you're getting all the senses when you're in a physical space with folks. So I think in the early advent of like tech, learning technology and online courses, it was like, hey, this is great, we're gonna pop a camera in the back of this lecture hall, we're gonna film it, we're gonna put it online, and then people will watch it and they're gonna get the same experience. But they don't, I mean, we've had this thing where it's like, it's one experience to experience a lecture in a room um, with others in real time. It's another to watch it on your laptop or on your phone or on your desktop or whatever. Um, it's just a different experience. So I'm not interested in that at all. Um, I think it's great to document those things and have it archived, but to try and convince ourselves that that can equal the learning that happens in that actual space, I think is a little bit misguided. Here's where I think it does make sense for like online learning. There are ways that people can present information uh, through the use of some type of new technology, digital technology, that you can't do um, in a physical space. So if that's the uh, addition of graphics or animations to help visualize a concept that someone is talking about, if I'm in a lecture while giving a lecture, and I'm trying to explain something, I've got the vision in my head about like how to think about this, and I might have a slide or two or something, but I can't have it pop up like, you know, in the middle of the, of the space here as I'm talking to just to kind of explain and visualize what it is I'm talking about. So if that's something you can do using digital technology you can't do in the classroom. I think another example too, and there's this, there's a subtle art to it, I think it can be abused, but music and sound effects. I think anyone who's listened to a good podcast realizes that they're like, oh my God, I'm so invested in this story and I'm following along and sometimes I don't even know why they're so hooked on it. If you go back and re-experience that, sometimes it's just the sound effects, maybe it's the ambient sound, maybe it's an actual musical track that's tapping into emotions that they want you to have as, as a listener. 
And so I think that's part of it as well. If you're trying to convey an idea or share a story, if you can provide bringing that musical uh, layer to it, it totally changes the experience. I mean, you take any movie that you've watched and you strip out the soundtrack, it's a completely different experience. So I think people are really starting to appreciate the, the value of music and, and sound, um, or like the uh, like sonic identity of, of a story. I think the other thing too, this is a little bit simpler because it doesn't involve animations or uh, royalty-free music or anything like that, it's just camera angles too. Um, so let's say that you do want to just film a lecture and you've got some people in the room and you've got some people who are joining a class somewhere else in the world. I think it's more possible now to have multiple camera angles because let's say I'm in, I'm in a lecture hall and I've got a great lecturer giving a presentation <clears throat> and there are certain points where she's telling something that has a different level of emotion to it. But I'm all the way in the back. I'm only experiencing her emotion from, you know, 15 yards away. But what if I had the ability to get really close to see how her eyes were changing as she was telling that part of the story, or her mouth, or her nose, or any of that type of stuff? A camera can capture that um, in a way that your eyes can't if you're there physically. So I think that's another way that just take the use of technology and create a learning experience that can't be replicated in the face-to-face space. And then I think the last part too is just, and I've touched on this a little bit, is the ability to connect with people across great distances. There's always a challenge, time zones, you know, uh, internet bandwidth and things like that. I think there are synchronous and asynchronous ways to get around that. But the more that we can connect people across cultural differences, geographic distances, I think the richer the learning will be, particularly when it comes to civil resistance. Because you can have one experience, a certain set of lessons learned, um, uh, you know, models for action that are within your own culture, um, but there are many that exist in other cultures. And I think particularly for the United States, the Western world, there's more work to be done with that, where I think we can turn to India, obviously Gandhi, we can turn to South Africa. There are a lot of movements, like thousands of movements that have happened around the world in places big and small that have these profound lessons about how to think strategically, how to engage members of a movement that are completely, they're not fully appreciated by particularly folks in, in the West because, you know, I mean, the example I gave is like the civil rights movement, like we can turn to that, we're connected to it, it makes sense. But there's a lot, a lot more out there that we can tap into, and like you know, great resource, the Nonviolent Action Database, um, has been an effort to expose people to that, and that was like a multi-year effort to go and collect all of these stories and all this information. And I feel like that's one of the best resources out there for people who want to know how to do this better. So yeah, I taught with my dad for many semesters at American University. We co-taught an education for international development class for undergraduate students. And that has been like one of the highlights of my life. Um, you know, my dad spent many years in the field of international development, 42 years at the World Bank. Um, and one of the reasons I got into education and training, particularly adult education, and, um, uh, you know, and experiential learning, it's because I watched him when I was in high school, middle school, high school, he ran a series of trainings for World Bank staff, implementing partners, you know, government, um, like partner country governments on the World Bank project cycle. And you know, for a 13 year old, it's kind of like, you know, how boring can you get? But you know, I'm traveling with my dad, we're going around the world, and, I remember one of these first workshops, he and the other facilitators that did these trainings, their whole attitude and approach in these spaces was so much more relaxed, so it wasn't rigid at all. They got people up moving, forming relationships, talking about their own experiences, and that's a tough nut to crack in some of these spaces. I mean, you're talking about some of these institutions, people are very, you know, um, they're very focused on hierarchy, prestige, status, and when there's a mixture and diversity of that in the space, you, you know,
know, that's a tough dance. But they were like masterful at breaking all that down to make room for learning across all these differences. And so the scenarios and the activities, all the things they were doing, I thought to myself, wait a minute, why isn't all education like this? Because it wasn't sitting at a desk listening to one person talk and like the picture example of like, you have the expert in front of the room, it's a pitcher of water, and then they're going around everyone's brain pouring their knowledge and everyone's like that. This is not how learning happens. Um, and so I, that was a model that I picked up on. So anyway, fast forward however many years later, 15 years later, I had, you know, done a lot of teaching and training in that model and then had the opportunity to teach at American University and so I reached out to him and said, hey, let's do this together because, um, you know, I've got teaching experience, I have some exposure to the field of international development, but not nearly as much as he did and he was coming up on retirement, so uh, he, he agreed and, um, you know, we did this together. So generationally, it's interesting because I think when we talk about our time together teaching, he, he thinks a lot about how he came in with this very much, I'm an expert and I'm gonna stand in front of the room wearing a suit and tell all these young people, what's up, <laughs> you know? And I came in with a different angle. And so, I mean, that's his experience and, and, and I respect that, but I also, cause, also want to remind him uh, and do often when we talk about this is that I knew that he would be good at this, and I knew that he would be on board with teaching together because of that experience I had with him when I was earlier, that he can do this experientially, and that he's not someone who's just full-throated endorsement of like, no, just lecture, and students don't say anything or participate anyway. So um, so that was great. It was also cool just to, the reaction that students would have when we would introduce ourselves on the first day, it would be like, oh, this is Richard Cambridge, I'm Darren Cambridge, and then, you know, we basically like, and yes, we are, you know, father and son. And oddly enough, I don't know if we don't look alike, but people are like, wait, what, really? It just boggled our mind that this is something that folks actually do. So I think the students got a lot out of it as well. Um, and so generationally too, you know, he can pull not only from his, when it comes to education and international development, he can pull from his own experience working in that space um, for the World Bank. Um, he grew up in Guyana, which again, upon reflection, he didn't feel like it when he was growing up, but in what folks would consider poverty. Um, and that's experience that I don't have, you know? And so to be able to tap into that um, was great for everyone's learning in the room, but it was also cool because I heard stories about my dad that I hadn't heard, you know, that up at that point, I was like, 28 or so um, that I hadn't heard yet. So I got to discover and learn more things about him in that process as well, which is cool. We got to spend a lot of time together. Now, traveling with my daughter, so I got two daughters. Um, one, her name is Kaya. She's seven years old. She's our first. And our second is Zoe. She's two and a half. So I haven't done much travel with Zoe yet, but with Kaya, any opportunity I had for her to come along and join me on, on these trips, be it facilitate a workshop or go to a conference, like I jumped at it. We were in Memphis, Tennessee at the Gandhi King Conference. And if you haven't been, you should go. Memphis is like one of my favorite cities in the country. It's phenomenal. And they have the um, Civil Rights Museum is in Memphis. And it's built uh, next to uh, the Lorraine Motel, which is where sadly Dr. King was assassinated. Um, so they have this amazing museum there. And I took her to it. And I'd been there like four times before. So I knew the things that you would see, the things that you would hear. I think she was maybe four at the time. I think she just turned four. And the first room that you walk into when you go in the museum is about the slave trade. And you walk in, you turn to the right. The first thing you see is a statue of slaves bound and chained together like this in the same way they would have been in a slave ship. And you turn to your left, and there's a statue of a mother on an auction block holding her child. And then you look down on the floor, and it's a map of the world with all the slave trade routes. And I'm there with a four, my four-year-old daughter. And I'm like, 
I don't know what questions she, she's going to ask. I haven't really thought about how I'm going to respond to them if they come, but you know, we're going to do this together. So she was asking, what's that? What's this? And I said, well, you know, these are statues of slaves. These are people who are stripped from their families, stripped from their homes, taken to other parts of the world and forced to do things that they didn't want to do. Um, and it's a horrible moment in history. Still happens to people today. Um, and this is an example of some of the ways that they were treated. So I mean, she's four, but I'm just gonna be real, right? And she's there, she has a little notepad. She's in the stroller, she has a little notepad. And she's four, she doesn't actually know how to write words and sentences yet, but she's like just scribbling on the pad. She goes, I, I wanna write this down, this is really important. <laughs> it's like, like what is happening here? You know, she was like really thinking about this. So anyway, we make our way through the museum and there's, it's a lot of visuals, a lot of videos, things that you're, you're seeing. So the next room, one of the next rooms is about the Montgomery bus boycott. So they have a replica of the bus from uh, Montgomery and you can walk in it and you can sit in it. And when you walk into the bus, the statue of the bus driver is he's, the wheels here, he's turning like this. And every 15 seconds or so says, hey, get to the back of the bus. And he yells at you. So I'm on the bus with my four-year-old daughter and we're taking this all in. And so, you know, we sit on the, on the chair and, and I explain a little bit about how, you know, there was a time where if you were black, they force you to sit in the back of the bus and you get off the bus. And then there's this great mural of all these um, police photos of women, all women who were arrested for refusing to sit in the back of the bus. So yes, there's Rosa Parks. There are dozens and hundreds of other women who risked arrest. So they have a picture there, their mug shots with their number, prison number. And I said, hey, let's just take a look at all these women here who refused to sit on the back of the bus and let's look at their faces. Like, what do you think they were feeling in this moment? Some, you know, just looked exhausted. I mean, they're barely awake. Some looked angry, some looked defiant, some were smiling. There's like a mixture of things. But we were able to talk and explore a little bit about like, how do you think people feel when they're told that they can't do something and they're disrespected as a result of that and they refuse to live like that anymore, and then they had to face these consequences. So that, that was just like an intense experience. But then we go to the next room. There were, I think, images of people getting sprayed with hoses, and the dogs attacking young people, and maybe she was seeing that, I don't know, but she says, Dad, I, you know, I wanna go. And she went from just interest, excitement, curiosity to like, I, I, I can't take any more of this in, right? And she looked very somber and very sad. And I said, no, that's fine. Let's make our way through the rest of the rooms. And, you know, because at the end of the day, she's four, right? Um, and so she was very silent for a while. We walked back home and <laughs> we got back to our hotel. And, and you know, it had been like 40 minutes at this point. And, um, I felt like she was at a point where we could debrief or talk about it a little bit. And I said, hey, you know, I just wanted to like check in. And you, know, you seem kind of sad at the end. When we were at the museum, you know, you want to share with me a little bit about what you're feeling. And she just said, you know, she said, you know, I saw a man who had been hurt. You know, I don't think it was like, I don't think there are images of like videos of people getting shot there. Um, but I just think her seeing that people who had violence inflicted upon them. You know, it was a lot. And I think to answer your question, it's like, I've been to that museum four or five times, and I've seen all those images too. 
You know, it don't like punch you in the gut until you see it through the eyes of a four-year-old. You know, and you know, she's seven now, and like, you know, I think it's a tough experience, uh, but I think a valuable one. Uh, but I'm really thankful for that, that she has this curiosity, and she also has the ability to say, like, you know, I've had enough. And I'm able to talk about it later. Um, you know, so, she's just a good kid. <laughs> um, the last story I'll tell about that trip was the keynote address was um, titled Revolutionary Love. And I'm forgetting the name of the speaker um, at my company, but it was the keynote address. And she was a civil rights, human rights lawyer. We watched it and we were there for maybe like 30, 40 minutes, which again, for a four-year-old is pretty long. And made it through pretty much the end of it. I took some pictures, whatnot, and I thought, eh, I don't know if she got anything out of this, whatever. So we got on the plane the next day, and I was going through all the photos that we had taken over the three days that we were there, just to kind of like remember, hey, remember we did this, we did that, we had this experience, and uh, and she's scrolling through, scrolling through on my phone, and she stopped on the picture of this woman giving the keynote address with this giant pink and red. PowerPoint slide behind it said like revolutionary love. And she just stopped and like stared at it and looked at it. Of all the pictures, like we did a lot of cool stuff, and like that was the picture she wanted to look at. It was like someone giving a PowerPoint presentation. And I said, Oh yeah, do you remember that? She's like, Yeah. And I was like, Yeah, what are you like, what are you thinking? On this phone, and she's like, Yeah, that was um like she was really brave. She's like, it must take a lot of courage to stand up there and speak in front of all these people. Um and we talked a little bit about like what she talked about and everything, but that was another moment where I was like, you never know like what a child is picking up in the moment um, and what they're getting out of it. And so I actually wrote the keynote speaker a long email after that and said, look, I just want you to know that you spoke directly to her, you know, and that was one thing that she's really taken away from this experience. And the fact that like, you know, Kai, could be there, see uh, a woman of color up on stage speaking to a large audience of people about revolutionary love. I mean, that's like the best thing ever, you know, for a parent to be able to like share that experience, you know, with her. So that's just one of like many experiences that, you know, I've had, you know, traveling with her and, and going to conferences. And then the other thing too is like going back to the Mubarak, Michael Beer, surrounding yourselves with people like them. The earlier you can surround yourself with those types of folks, that type of energy, the better. And so, you know, I go to like the Peace and Justice Studies Association Conference or the Gandhi King Conference or we have it, you just know there's going to be these amazing people there having amazing conversations, like just giving off this amazing energy. Um, and to be a three, four, five, six year old in those spaces is I think the greatest gift you know, I can provide for her as she grows up. My parents provided that for me. And so, um, you know, I think it's, it, it has an effect, sure. This is Darren Cambridge speaking with Nonviolence International. Thanks for watching.